Okay, all right, everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining IPCNY tonight. I'm Jen Bradovich, I'm IPCNY's Exhibition and Curatorial Manager, and I'm super happy to be hosting this talk with Tiana Bui, Michelle Melo, and Diego Morales Portillo. These artists each have works currently on view in IPCNY's Winter 2020 edition of our New Prints program. New Prints is in its 20th year at IPCNY, and twice a year, these exhibitions gather print-based works made in the previous 12 months um, through an open call process that attracts over a thousand submissions. Each show is juried by folks out in the field of print. So the current show is called Mapping Narratives and it was selected by Black Women of Print, an African diaspora centered platform that supports the work of independent, mid-career and established skill level Black women printmakers. Um, you can see the show now uh, in our Chelsea exhibition space. Um, you can also explore the show virtually on our website. There is a 3D scan of the gallery. Um, you just click on that little banner, takes you to the scan. And you can walk around almost like as if you're there. You can click on these little blue dots that bring up information about the work. You can also on the website um, explore the works in the show by clicking on any of the images on this page and you can read uh, the artist's um, statements about the work. So please do take some time to explore digitally if you're not able to come see the show in person. So two notes um, about accessibility tonight. First, the event has live captioning in English. You can find the captions by using the CC button at the bottom of your screen on desktop or by going to the settings menu on mobile. Um, second, we'll provide some visual description tonight. So I am a white woman wearing um, a black top and blazer with red lipstick and my hair is up and I'm sitting in my apartment with a plant. Um, we'll try to be descriptive about the works that we discuss on screen, which helps all of us at home who are experiencing art through our devices right now. Tonight's program will also be recorded and available on our YouTube account in a couple of weeks. Um, so let's get going. I will ask our artist to join me on screen. Come on back. Hello, hello, Tiana. Hello, Diego. Hello, Michelle. Um, I'm really pleased to be speaking with these artists tonight. They all have really interestingly interdisciplinary practices and they all think a little bit differently, I think, about how print fits into those practices in different ways. So we'll try to get a dialogue going tonight. Um, you can send questions using the Q&A function throughout the talks. The public chat will also be open. So you can feel free to contribute to the conversation there by sharing comments or thoughts that aren't direct questions. Um, please keep things on topic and reflective of the curious, constructive and inclusive space that we aim to create for all programs at IPCNY. And finally, there will be a really quick survey at the end. We really appreciate your feedback, including, are you disengaged with the Zoom webinar format? What do you think about maybe doing more intimate talks like these as a meeting format so that people are a little more participatory in the conversation instead of being on the other side of this webinar, trying to recapture some of that community spirit that our artist talks for new prints had in the before times. Um, let us know what we can do to improve those talks. Um, so to begin, we'll go alphabetically. Um, before the presentations, I just wanna ask each artist to briefly say hello, um, introduce themselves so we know your voice and give a one second um, little visual description. Tiana, we'll start with you. Hi, my name's Tiana Bowie. Um, I am, I'm in Detroit and I'm sitting in front of, well, I'm African-American woman. I'm sitting in front of a nice wooden background. And I believe this color that I'm wearing is truffle. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Melo. I'm joining from the gallery. I have the privilege to be here in IPCNY. Um, my background is uh, a one with the, the work, my work and some other works. Thanks, and Diego. Um, hello, I'm Diego Morales Portillo. I am um, Hispanic, I'm wearing glasses, uh, black sweater and I'm like in my home space and you can see kind of can see one of my works in the back. Awesome. Thanks each of you. Um, so now let's get going. Let's turn it over to our first artist. Tiana, you'll go first. Awesome. Thank you. OK. 
okay, just want to move this around the way. Okay, thank you guys so much for having me and thank you everyone showing up to uh, be here. I just wanted to start and talk about um, uh, what I've been up to, I think, and also what I've been interested in. So I, my talk topics are work, rest, reflection, and humor, things that have been keeping me sane, I feel like in the last year or so. But I wanted to like uh, maybe start with a very personal photograph of me when I was in the first to second grade. Um, I grew up on the South side of Chicago. My background very briefly is I grew up in the foster care system and I'm very vocal about uh, my, my upbringing as I moved through multiple homes and didn't get to keep a lot of the memorabilia. So it's become very precious to me. And a little bit that I have, I basically work those images really, I work them to death, I feel. So this image that we're looking at on the screen is a class photograph of me. I'm there in the middle and to, you know, here's my little pointer, there I am. And so I, once I got, um, once I was able to get these images from my mom, I started to use them in my work. And so my work is very image-based, specifically photo-based. And so the first time I remember working these images into a piece, I actually embedded my <laughs> report card from that time into the piece. So here's a piece over here, but here, here's a close-up to the right. And there's some, if you see there's some, some, some report in the, in the middle thrown in there, infused in the imagery. And also there's, a, there's an image of me with, um, a circle over my face, which that's my nod to Baldessari. But also I was thinking about being invisible in, in school because once the teacher found out I was in foster care, I just remember um, the stigma that was placed on me and having that burden at a young age. And so back to another very personal image. And I, 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 I um, my uncle died in prison in 2009 and I was in graduate school at the University of Madison. And when he, at the time that he died, my mother was currently incarcerated and she really wanted me to make some art about my uncle. And I remember um, I remember that probably being the hardest thing I had to do. And I also remember being at an artist residency um, and one of the visiting artists said to me, you know, my work is a little too personal. So when I, when I made this work, I specifically made it more personal on purpose. That was my way of answering that. Like, oh, okay, so it's not personal enough, got it. And so I really delved deep into um, I, I, I didn't know my uncle very well, but the little interactions I had with him were very pleasant, but I also felt like he should not be um, classified as this inmate, this person who did a um, multiple, you know, um, he, he was a repeat offender. And so I felt like he, I wanted to give him a space outside. So at the Women's Studio Workshop in 2012, I was invited as a, as a, as a um, artist in residence and I got to work on this piece. Uh, with with his image and then I had a show at, at Northwestern University in Chicago where I basically only had his mugshots to go off of no other photographs so I took that and then I thought about the history of uh, my family growing up in, in Mississippi um, the great migration and also coming from Mississippi is, uh, is if you wear a carnation on the right side of your um, shoulder then that means someone passed away so thinking about those icons and symbols once again working very heavily um, and it's a I remember this piece is pretty large scale. And I think what's, what I like about this piece, I, I remember this was 2012, I showed it, rolled it up, put it away. And then in 2018, I was invited to have a show. Um, and also I did some other series of this image of him, his mug shots from the front. And um, just all of the, I looked at his rap sheet and got to see all of the things he was in prison for. Um, and so, and actually in this piece is actually titled Sweet Escape because he died in prison. And it was like, he wasn't due to be paroled into 2020. And that was in 2009 when he passed. So just imagine how long he would have been in, and he already grew up pretty much in the prison system as well. And so uh, fast forward to 2018, I was invited to be in this exhibition um, at, um, in Kalamazoo. And it was an exhibition with about anybody who has a history with people being incarcerated or if you make work about that. So it was very, um, awesome that I got to be a part of uh, this exhibition years later and put the work on display with other artists and also got to meet Angela Davis of the Black Panther Party. So I thought it was very beautiful how art can put you in a place where you're not, you're not necessarily thinking about this hyper political space, but you're all of a sudden catapulted into this place. And I got to be in a um, panel discussion with um, Angela Davis and I got to make her laugh. So that was, I think a huge, beautiful full circle moment where that piece that I made about my uncle very, I don't have a personal, um, I don't, I've not been to prison myself, but having to be a family member, dealing with family members who are constantly incarcerated and, and the burden and the toll that takes on family. 
So going back to personal images, um, uh, so I, I wanted to do a series. I, first of all, I think anybody who still has Polaroids, good on you. <laughs> Not everybody has Polaroids anymore. There's a whole generation of people that's gonna grow up without Polaroids. Um, and so I think it's always beautiful to appreciate the Polaroids you have in your life. So I started making these large scale series of, um, of, of my family members, just basically celebrating. And growing up, it was a very, it was tumultuous, but it was also um, lots of happy times. So I was trying to cover all the tracks of how does that, how does that look? And my grandfather um, pictured here, who I never got to meet. Um, this is my uncle who actually passed away in prison when he was little. And this is my other uncle. My uh, grandfather um, passed away of alcohol, alcoholism or um, cirrhosis of the liver. And so in this image, he's holding a cup. And I was like, what a glimpse into the little bit that I know about him and his, uh, his habit with drinking. And so I think it's such a beautiful thing when photographs can tell you you know, a little bit about someone if you don't have the full story. And so then I continued to make um, these images of that's my mom and I wasn't born yet. And finally, and these images are new to me because I had to get my aunt to like, let me see them after, you know, after all these years and my brother getting ready for church or Easter, I believe, and um, a birthday party with, you know, homemade cupcakes. <laughs> and so, and also the, this position that I found myself in all the growing up black is getting, uh, is my aunt doing my hair and getting it ready for Easter. And so I went in, um, so I had a, I really wanted to kind of, I think, celebrate these moments in black life or specifically in my life of this idea of celebration of also being an everyday, in an everyday situation. So I also um, made some actual objects that were pictured in a lot of the photographs that I was using um, that were from the 90s or the um, actually the 60s. So this was a photograph that I had thrown to reproduce the actual photograph from the image. And this is a show that I had, um, actually my major museum show that I had in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, which I got to have this beautiful culmination where I brought all these, these conversations together. And there's the objects that were in the photographs that I never got to have because our um, family home was burned down. There was no remnants and in, um, in my history, you know, my family had wealth at one point. And so there, so having to go back and look at photograph evidence, like photographic evidence of that, that was there because I could have had that beautiful mid-century table. And even if it's modest furniture, I'm like, I could have had that, could have saved me so much money on my own furniture. And so um, being able to put these, this series into a um, space, fast forward. So this is of course, um, I think being an artist and living in this and what's going on. And I think specifically with George Floyd and I was in, at the University of Iowa, last year during all of the um, during, you know, coronavirus and uh, George Floyd. And so I immediately went into a very reflective, pensive space that I didn't even expect and wasn't sure, but it just touched me and so much was going on and there was so much energy in the air for change. And that definitely sparked me into this, uh, this mode of activism that I did not uh, expect where I put together a group of uh, artists in Milwaukee, artists uh, in, not, uh, or, people who are in charge of art spaces. So gallery collect, like gallery owners and people who play a, who play a part. And then also um, a friend of mine in Brooklyn and then a friend in Chicago who specialize in um, the history of just African-American history and art and put them together in a conversation. And Michelle Grabner's in there to talk about, because everybody's like, well, what do we do now? You know, as, as being, being, being white, being a part of the institution, what do we do? So I had this, Put together this huge panel where we got to talk about those things and then um moving forward going back to like another you know full circle moment where the art you're making starts to have a conversation in a broader sense so i got to i was tapped by shepherd ferry to be a part of a mural in milwaukee to talk about voter suppression which milwaukee has one of the highest voter suppressions i had to witness my family actually go through it they went to vote and they when they went somewhere the doors weren't, the doors were locked. So they had to go somewhere else and they had to chase down the place to vote. And I said, that's why this mural has to come to Milwaukee. So to be asked to basically take, an, take one of my pieces and implement it into the mural. So this is a, um, my aunt Florence who um, is in her eighties, my great aunt. And I thought it was very, I did this piece in 2017 of her and me and Shepard got to talking and he was like, I like this image. I was like, I do too. She's like, he's like, let's, let's infuse this into the mural. And so this is just a little piece of the mural. Um, sorry, let's just, yeah, there we go. So that was a piece of the mural. And so there's my um, aunt at the top of the mural in, 
in Milwaukee. And it was such a, once again, one of those moments where your images got to breathe life in another way and very unexpected. And just gonna go through some stuff here. The last piece in the series, which is in the, um, at the International Prison in New York is this piece that I did later, which I did this piece in 2020. And so that was an image of my brother and my cousin going back to the personal imagery. And then the, 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 the fun part of what I've been doing lately or the relaxation part is playing with the Reface app, which I don't know if anybody knows about it. A lot of people do at this point. So I feel like I'm in this place where I'm visible in plain sight. And so I'm having fun. Um, just gonna. I've just been having fun uh, working with this app and actually have a show up right now in Detroit with another artist by the name of Chelsea Flower. So we did a um, a piece together in a show called Duel. Um, can't think of it right now. So, uh, and we're in, and we got to have this conversation with the Reface app and Reface and putting taking her face, swapping it on a GIF, on an image, um, and the same thing. And so taking images from the media of what went on with the, with the capital, whatever things are happening in the media and we're just responding to them in the most interesting way. Um, and the show's called Dual Visions. And then the last thing that I've been up to is curator, like uh, being tapped to be a curator actually. So I'm, I'm putting together an exhibition at the Trout Museum of Art in Milwaukee, Wisconsin with 61 artists that I put together. Uh, and the exhibition opens this Friday and it'll be a virtual component as well. And so I tapped people that I didn't know, I went on, I researched, I found people on social media and wanted to have this really great show where it's called um, Unraveled, Restructured, Revealed, where contemporary art and diverse perspectives intersect. And lastly, I'm in the very, I'm also still in a reflective place, but I am um, also doing a, helping doing a fundraiser for this organization in Arizona, where they helped with, they helped with the indigenous community who were um, ravished by COVID. And also it's a trauma informed state and they really specialize in childhood trauma and me growing up with um, physical abuse and, and childhood trauma, it's very important as an artist for me that I'm like, I find a way to give back. Thank you. Thank you, Tiana. There's so much there to try to <laughs> unpack. And I know these artist talks are kind of tough because we ask everyone to start with sort of a 10 minute um, presentation and uh, it's hard to gloss everything in 10 minutes, but um, I think there's a lot that we can start with. I just want to ask like a couple of questions. And if you have questions for Tiana, um, pop them into the chat. I'll take uh, one that's in there now. And at the end, we'll, we'll have time to, to raise questions to all the artists. So definitely get your questions in. Um, one I have is like, I, I the issue of scale uh, seems really important in your work. And my like first artistic background is in photography. And I, so I love your use of these Polaroids and these like vernacular personal images. Um, how do you think about the way that you have sort of reconstituted them into these large um there are they always monoprints yeah they're actually um uh for my for my printmaker geeks out there it's reduction screen print um shout out to susan Chikowski, my undergrad professor who taught me everything that i know i always say that and uh and also the faces are done in a um in a monotype so it's using karen dosh on a screen and then you just what you get is what you get so you know take one shot and so i wanted that effect of you don't really get to see the faces fully because it, they're, they're, they're family, they're personal images, yeah. right? So how do I, and we didn't grow up that, we weren't that close. I think about that. We were close for a moment, but not really. So yeah, there's, a, there's a weird like familiarity in them. Yeah. I think is clear that you're you, that you're mining personal history, but there's also a kind of estrangement from those faces. And so my my other question was how you process those images to get that almost painterly application. So that makes sense. Yes. Um, and, and so did you, were you, did you feel this leap to working in, in a public forum in the, in this mural format was like, yeah. I can see how you kind of get larger and larger and larger. How, yeah. is that, how do you think about those issues of scale? I think, well, well been, I didn't have to do the mural. So that was, that was, that was amazing. But to watch the whole process, a mural makes sense. I, I, I remember being an anti-mural for a moment. I was like, oh, murals are everywhere. And I was like, Oh wait, I, okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm on the bandwagon in this way of of scale. You're right, and I and, and being putting that image in that space. It's actually it exists as a 38 by 50 image, the the original. But then now it's on a whole nother level. I was like, that is amazing. It makes me, of course, now I get 
the allure of obs the obsession that artists have with big, some artists. And so I, it's there. <laughs> and if you've seen the show in person uh, at IPCNY or other times that you've seen uh, similar works of Tiana's in, um, in, in galleries, you know that the way that these large uh, prints kind of, they have like this very visceral impact seeing them so, so large and like interesting relationship to the body. So that's, it's interesting to think about how you're dealing with those questions. Um, someone in the audience says, I detail I noticed seeing living room portrait in person was the 3D pieces of necklace that the figures are wearing. How do you think about the use of found objects in your work? Thank you. And you know what? I totally forgot about it. So I appreciate it. <laughs> I struggled with that. So I can't believe I forgot about it. Um, I think if they're, because they're life scale, right? The, the benefit of things being life scale, you can actually put actual real life things in it. And so what I'm like, so for me, I'm like, what subtle thing can I throw in there that's not over the top? And that would just be a very beautiful implementation that wouldn't overtake it. And that's how I think of it. I don't, I think of it last actually, not first. So I was like, oh, a, a chain would actually fit because it's actual life skills. Uh, yeah. So yeah, but good question. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. And it is really subtle. Like I, the first couple of times I saw the um, work in the space, I didn't notice it until I <laughs> really up close with it. And and it's, so it's a really nice touch. And it, it reminds me that in preparing for this talk that you, I remember asking you, like, you're a printmaker, like, through and through, right? And, and then, <laughs> and, on, right. and on your website, you know, these works are, are you kind of categorize them as mixed mm -hmm. media. And so I yeah. think the way you're thinking about that layer and materials really comes through. Yeah. Um, one more question from Erica, and then we'll go to our next um, artist, um, but keep asking questions, is what's the most challenging project um, emotionally and mentally? Oh my God, definitely excellent question. And definitely working with my uncle's image. I had to, I, I remember having to print out his mugshot that I printed out actually to send to my mom who was incarcerated at the moment. So I had to t break the news to her that her, her brother died and while she's in jail. And that was really hard. And so when she was like, I, I, can you make some art? And of course I did an entire exhibition that's been, that was traveling and, and Angela Davis got to actually see it and talk about it, which was so amazing. So, and then my other uncle sent me pictures I mean, sent me um, letters thanking me for talking about his brother in this in this way, and so that was the most emotional because I we didn't get to um, see him or talk to him for years before he died in prison because his last name was spelled wrong, mm -hmm. so annoying, and so we could not find. We tried, and then when he passed away, it was like, okay, here he is. We're gonna put him in some ashes and ship him in a box to you, and that whole situation was just very sad and so very cathartic of me to do it, but also trying to get close to him, yeah, in some way. Thank you, good question. Great question. Thank you, um, Tiana. Keep asking more questions. I know I have more to ask you uh, and we'll, we'll open and bring everyone uh, on screen and at the end for more. Um, so I'll invite Michelle back um, to give an introduction to her work. Hello. Hello, Michelle. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being in the gallery. So I'll turn it over to you if you wanna do your little um, introduction and then we'll ask some questions. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. I'm so happy to be here in the gallery uh, with my work from the back. Um, yeah, my name is Michelle Melo. I am a, an artist, a Latino woman. I was born and raised in Colombia and I live in New York. For the, I've been living in New York for the last 15 years. Um, as an artist, I've been always, um, paying special attention to the objects and the meaning they have, the history and stories they tell. And I, um, and I have a special interest with uh, gender and intimacy. So I'm always concerned with uh, gestures and objects that relate to stories um, that could share a common place. I could share a common place with other females or other women. So this work is mixed media. It's on uh, uh, fabric, spring and fabric. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to, uh, to the fabric. I, um, I've been working with fabric um, since 2013. Um, I've been always searching about the language that, that could um, articulate together everything that I want to say and I want to, you know, hold together all the languages. Uh, so I'm going to share. Let me share the screen. I hope you have 
Oh my, let me just share the screen. Okay, this um, is um, the first work I did on fabric, which is called Nomada in Spanish, that is the same as Nomad. Um, it's, um, it comes from my affinity to, uh, with textiles because of the quality, the haptic qualities and the possibility to touch it. And also for the, it's easy to store and it was easier to, it's very plastic material. It's, I can fold it, I can take it home, I can, you know, you can make a show in like five minutes. So it has a lot of work. Um, it, it's called, I got very interested in quilting. Quilting is a process. Usually you re refer to quilting as the blankets that we see here in American quilts, but actually quilting is the, is the process of joining at least three fabrics together by stitching. So all of these uh, images, they are six different panels and they are stitched together. They look like prints, but they are actually um, fabric. So now I would like to show you the actual one of the panels that I have right here so you can appreciate the texture. It's all of this is fabric. It's, um, the background is muslin which gives you a little bit of texture. Um, the black part is also fabric, but it looks like ink, where I found some affinities with printmaking. This is a little bit more. Um, this work came from, from these um, linoleum cuts, linoleum cuts that I, I was exploring some um, areas of um, color layering and these reduction blocks. They, they were the first works that I was doing before um, going to the fabric. Um, at the same time I was working on fabric, I was reflecting on my roots and how I could, I, um, I wanted to find a textile that I could relate to as a Latino artist, as a Latina woman. And um, in that search of my roots, my identity, my identity um, I found the molas. Molas are a kind of quilt made by women in Panama. Here you can, you know, locate Panama. It's in Central America, and it's next to Colombia, where I was born and grew up. At the north of Panama, at the north of Colombia, next to Panama, there are this group of indigenous people called Cuna, and the Cuna women make molas. Molas are a kind. This is one of the women making a mola. The uh, molas are a kind of uh, textile that um, is made by placing layers of cloth on one on top of the other. And the final design is achieved by cutting out the upper layers. I will show you later. This is a sample of a mola. It's two layer mola, it's black and yellow, but, and the figure in the middle is uh, applicable. Applique is like a, a figure that you cut out and sew on top of, of everything. This is another kind of mola. That would be a three layer mola with abstract uh, designs from the nature and the jungle. And this one is the work that came uh, after doing this research about the molas and how I could relate to it, I came out with these Species Migrantes, which is a big mola that I create. create. And I want to show it. Oops. 
I wanted to show you. I have it right here. This is the big mola. It's uh, it has many layers, and I I was working with the same the same fashion the more the Puna women were working with the maize, and it's actually still species migrantes because it's a migrant species, and it has um, a map. It also has this um, uh, symbology and imaging. Images that come from the indigenous people that I could relate to. Oh so that was the Mola. And then I found out some similarities from the textile work, the specific technique that the Kuna women use with the, some printmaking techniques, like in, because both of them use a sharp tool, you know, to make the mola, you need to cut with sharp scissors, the upper layer that I will show you by the end of this presentation. And also to make a lino cut, lino cut or wood cut, you need to use them on also a sharp tool. These two are the um, reduction block plates that I did for the first portrait that I show you at the beginning. And here I, I show you how, how is made the process, what is the process to make the molas. This is a three layer mola. It's um, with uh, three layers of fabric and there is the design. Um, you cut it out to uncover um the 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 fabric underneath this is the process to get there and this would be the last one here you can see there are three layers of fabric so from that my work start evolving and then i decided to incorporate machine stitches not only three layers but also three layers of fabric, but also machine stitches and hand stitches and embroidery um, to create the images. Here you, could, you see the um, piece that I have here in the gallery that I was uh, playing with the prints that the, the actual fabric comes with and some, playing the composition with the embroidery and some drawing and silk screen. So that's pretty much what I have been doing. It's, it, it relates to stencil and layering and well, printmaking. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Michelle, what I love about your presentation is that, you know, when we first started chatting, you said, well, I'm not really like a printmaker, you know, what did I talk about? Um, but I think what's so compelling about your presentation is that you really outlined the way that you, the way that these women making molas, the way that they build up those images through that layering. And there's such a, um, an interesting graphic quality to those that I think re I see really echoed in the print the printmaking approach and I I feel I mean there are printmakers in the audience you all tell me but I feel that 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 process of layering or or the the reduction process either one I can see both of these being like really I think if you're a print person that you might think that these are really printerly way of approaching how to make an image. And so there's a, a very compelling parallel th there for me, the way that uh, a print printmaker might use those layers and the way that you're describing the, the process of putting these molas together and, and layering your textiles. And I wondered, are you, is this the first time that you've used silkscreen for this piece? Yes, it's the first time. Actually, I was looking for a, um, a way to print the images directly on fabric that could be, that I could play with drawing and also the stitches. And then I found silk screen that is like gold for me. <laughs> you know? 
did you, what, what, how did, can you just tell me like what sparked that, that um, silkscreen discovery? Like what, what made the light bulb go off for you that that was the way to get a sort of drawing like gesture or graphic on top of the, on top of the um, textiles? Um, as I show you with the first panel, I was working with the big areas and solid color. And so it was solid and plain fabric, but with, the time I discovered that the fabric, I realized the fabric has printed itself. Right. So right. I wanted to play with those prints and then work with my images on top of the prints to see how I could like find a, a sense of depth, um, you know, make it a little bit more graphic. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's interesting that there's already that patterning on the and and that silkscreen and textile have such an interesting like history together as well. Um, Alana in the audience asks, how do you feel about the relationship between print and fabric uh, being different than print and paper? Do you have any thoughts about that? Oh, I, I think uh, I love paper, and I have been trying, you know, trying some prints on paper, but. With fabric, as I mentioned at the first, at the beginning, it's the possibility to fold it. It, it, it gets the ink in a different way. You don't need the press, except well, you, you, could, you could use a um, wood block, but in silk screen, you don't need the press actually. And it's the possibility is endless. You, can, you can also have the texture. I don't know if you can. You know, you have to touch, and this is the yeah. this is something that I love that that you can touch the fabric that is not possible with the paper. You know, right? right. So then this is something that um, gets things well better for me, and it's easy to handle. It could also be um, like a sculptor spatial. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's interesting that you're, uh, you know, I think from a distance or digitally, these read as feeling very, um, the layers feel kind of flat um, in, a, in a very, like a way that also feels like printerly to me as a non-printer, but again, printers in the, Megan Duffy in the audience, tell me. Um, but in fact, once you see them in person and you handle them, you realize that they do have that sort of body, like tactile quality to them. So it's a really nice um, play on the optics, I think. Um, lots of good questions here for um, Michelle. I'm just going to take one more now so that we can make sure we get to Diego. And then I'm going to keep these on deck for when we bring everyone back. So um, one person in the audience says, um, uh, I love every mixed media composition, so much work. How long does it take you to make one textile piece? Oh, it depends. For example, with the species migrantes, they were five panels, big panels, as you know, 36 by 24 inches. Mm -hmm. And it took me, I, I was, for that when I was working like day and night, it took me about three months. Wow. And a lot of handwork because I use embroidery scissors to uncover the layers. Um, for the one that I have here in the gallery, it has embroidery, it has some like kind of um, collage. Mm -hmm. And silk screen, the silk screen was the fastest part, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. But then, Playing with the um, silhouettes, um, the, I use embroidery as drawing, as a mark, a gesture of drawing, not exactly as a decoration. It took a lot of time, especially the egg. I don't know if you have seen the one yellow egg in the middle has a lot of little um, dots. It takes, it took me, I don't know, a month. But I, that was the one of the first works I started doing during quarantine. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was great. You know, and it's it, uh, it remind it it recenters this question of labor for me and, and women's labor and artistic labor and just what, what arises in the time spent on creating these pieces. So there's a lot to unpack there. Thank you so much, Michelle. There's so many questions for you. Feel free to answer that type answers um, into the sure. chat just to make sure we could get to everyone's questions because there's some really great ones in there. 
Um, okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so I'll have Diego join me. Um, we'll see his work and then we'll be bringing everyone back together. I'll just ask uh, another question here to Michelle while we wait for Diego to sort out a little tech issue. Um, Michelle, you can feel free to just answer with your, oh, there you are, great. Um, uh, Phyllis asks, does the Mullah tradition inv involve collaboration between the women? Did you ask me? <laughs> does, the, does the Mullah tradition involve collaboration? Yes. And, and it's very traditional. They, they work together and they pass this tradition from their grandmothers to the mothers to the daughters. And it's very interesting that the, the way they, they compose the, the images. Actually, the molas, the actual molas are 20 by 20 inches because they are intended to wear uh, as uh, tops for the women. And they use, they have all of these, um, symbology and, and composition and images from the, the jungle nature. Also men work, but they work the same kind of um, subject, but they do with singing. So it's very interesting. Women use fabric and they use their voice. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. I wish we had a little more time to get into that. <laughs> um, Diego, are you all set? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So um, take it yeah. away. Sure. Uh, da -da. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Um, so uh, my name is Diego Morales Portillo. I'm a visual and um, multidisciplinary yeah. artist from um, Guatemala. Um, so my work is about uh, creating non-functional systems um, and spaces by structuring absurd actions, uh, which are doomed to fail. My work illustrates the absurdism in the dominant white Western narratives by challenging and undermining the concept of universality as an ideology imposed to everyone else in the world. Um, as a BIPOC immigrant from the very global south. Um, my historical position is to produce so the Westerners can consume. Um, so this defines my multidisciplinary practice uh, in which the act of making and labor are a way of living. Uh, therefore my practice is not about the physical final product, but um, it's about the conceptual meaning that supports the absurd um, action in a, in a historical context. Uh, so to illustrate this a little bit more, um, I'm gonna show you a couple um, projects that are related to that. Uh, this project is called uh, False Memory Syndrome. Uh, this was a, I see as an imaginary museum gallery that holds these objects that records histories that are not recognized in the, the official history. Um, narratives that are not more clear, narratives that are not recognized in the official uh, US history. So all these um, ceramic vessels contain uh, or illustrate histories of violence during the US invasions um, and occupations. All of this information is a result of an investigation with the, with the classified UA, um, CIA documents. So the idea with this was to show like this obscure narratives uh, in a way to show the violence against civilian populations. Um, so these vessels were um, basically assaulted to show these ways of violence. For example, this is a, um, I, this vessel was hit with a metal bar. This one was shot with a gun. So I see this as an impossible space because it's something that is not part of a the official history. So are not, it's not real. Um, it cannot be a real um, exhibition. Um, Bubble was another project. This was a project that I proposed to the uh, uh, Multnomah County Library, which is the main central gallery uh, library here in Portland. Um, so this uh, project was about um, proposing a taking all the books that are not written in English and place them with the main body of knowledge in the Dewey Decimal System. The way that the, the Dewey Decimal System works nowadays is that um, 
For example, a science book on English is placed on the science section and a science book on Vietnamese is placed on the world section. So the idea with this project was to place all these books that are not written on English in the main um, body of the Dewey Decimal System. So this is a close-up and you can see the color column is where the position that I'm proposing for these titles. Um, and in this case, this is a, this, a system meant to fail because, for example, if you only speak Japanese, um, you can have access to a book that are next to the ones that you are looking for, which means that you are not going to be totally, it's going to be kind of hard for you to find books that you can actually read. So the idea with proposing this system to a library was to, um, in some way, propose a, a book, that, a, a project that sounds so beautiful to, to actually accomplish, but it's seemed to fail because we still have some differences as humankind. Um, so it's a way to open the conversation about those uh, differences and maybe in the future create a actual working system. Um, so all of this led us to a um, proposal for Habitat for Humankind, which is the part of the series that are on uh, display at IPCNY's exhibition. Um, so this series, it's a series of architectural proposals for impossible buildings and spaces. Um, this means that our structures that are impossible to build uh, are built with impossible forms and they are like, as I like to call it, like uh, architectural aberrations because some of them doesn't have a roof, some of them doesn't have an, an entrance. Um, so when I was, uh, when I started this project, designing this project, um, I didn't really have like a clear idea of what would be the final form, like how it would look like. I was designing the buildings, but I didn't know how to make them visible. Uh, and then the most logic idea came to my mind. Like if it's a, an architectural proposal, I should use a blueprint. So um, that's why I started using uh, cyanotype, which is the, um, a technique invented in um, 1842. Uh, it's one of the techniques that um, were being developed uh, when photography was being explored as a medium, uh, and then was adopted by architects to reproduce their blueprints. That's where the name comes from. Um, so yeah, I started this, uh, series of, uh, exonometric projections of, as a way to propose as something that it's meant to fail, a structure that is meant to fail. And this series works as a metaphor for me, for a metaphor for the, um, postmodern ideals of unity in humankind that we were going to be able to coexist in harmony, which sadly in the last years, and especially during the pandemic, we realized that this is not true. And going this goes against all the theories that we were hoping that will be true. Um, so talking a little bit more, uh, little bit more about the process, um, I start sketching these um, structures and like with pen and paper, just trying to figure out how to make it work spatially. Um, and how to make it fit, make all the parts fit, and at the same time to not make sense, uh, which ironically, some making something that doesn't work, it's kind of hard to make. Um, then I take all of that and I digitalize it in Adobe um, Illustrator. Uh, and that, then with that file, I make this negative on a transparent film. I print it on a laser printer. Um, and then I expose it on this UV exposure machine. Um, so for those who are not uh, familiar with the cyanotype process, uh, cyanotype is a mix of two chemicals, um, sodium ferrocyanide, ferrocyanide and um, ferric ammonium, um, which when you mix them are photosensitive. So what you do with that mix is that you coat a piece of paper and um, and then you expose it to light and the parts that are exposed to light will become blue. So I use these UV exposure machines because our, um, you can get like a more even color and honestly, machines are so cool because they just suck all the air out of the machine. So the negative makes total contact with the paper. Um, on, personally, I love um, 
this dark blue. So in order to get the darkest blue that could be possible, I do three coats of, um, of cyanotype. Uh, then I wash it. So here we can see like a, the white parts are the parts that are not exposed to light, which means that the nail, it was there. So that we end up with this um, like really defined lines, which are like, again, like it's basically a shadow that is not being exposed by the light um, to get this um, like really homogenous um, blue prints. Uh, this is the piece that is on view on IPC and Y right now. Um, so after making some of these prints, I started like thinking how to incorporate the process itself in the final piece. So um, I start with this piece that you see right now. Um, so what you're seeing here right, in, in this piece is the juxtaposition of the negative with the um, actual exposed blueprint. Um, so you can see it more here. Uh, basically where it is that I um, 3D, um, I use a laser uh, carver to carve a piece of plexiglass to use as a negative and then I expose the cyanotype. So you end up with these pieces. So yeah, I wanted to show the process as part of the piece and show both, um, both of the elements um, mounted together. Um, then I start like thinking how to evolve this series. Um, and obviously the next step on a proposal for architecture would be like to make a model, but I found really difficult to make a model of something that is impossible to build. Um, so then I, I came up with this um, solution to create a, I, 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 I call it like as a fail attempt for a maquette. Um, because are still, it's a still a 2D structure, but it's rendered as a 3D. So um, I, I like this play back and forth of what can be a 3D object and the absurdity of making a model of something that's impossible to build. Um, and from there, I start like testing some um, some more actual construction materials uh, and playing with this concept of um, construction. And I made these uh, maquettes that are made with cast cement and plexiglass. Um, that I see as a cornerstone and at the same time it's a structure itself. Um, so where the project is leading, this series is leading right now, it's on this, um, I'm, I'm still using construction materials like um, MDF and, um, and plywood to make this, um, 3D structures in a 2D way. Um, and this is to frame it in the uh, conceptual space of a building, of a construction, that is something that's being built. Um, thank you. Thanks, Diego. I like these a lot. Um, and uh, I, I just want to, uh, uh, there's a, a question from an anonymous attendee. I love the idea. Uh, oh, it's not a question. It's just a comment. But I agree with this person. I love the idea of an architectural aberration. It's interesting to take something as utilitarian as a blueprint and make it sort of fantastical. And uh, this reminds me of um, our chat before the talk where you said you weren't, you aren't specifically, I had asked you, are you referencing specific buildings or are there, are there certain buildings you've looked at? And you said, I'm more interested in the idea of a building, right? This concept of a structure, less so any specific structures that already exist. Um, do you, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, your, uh, your interest in that a little more and how you, when we spoke, we talked a little bit about brutalist architecture as kind of a concept, kind of a vaguely, a reference that kind of vaguely exists in the way that you're thinking about these structures. But what is it that interests you about those kind of, uh, for, for anyone at home who's not familiar with brutalist architecture, a very like utilitarian, but like at once uh, utopian way of thinking about building design. And, and there's some irony there in your, um, your approach to these as being, uh, as being impossible, right? Can you think a little, or talk a little bit more about how you think about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so in general, I, I have like a, I would say that I have like a very 
um, like utilitarian and, and very like conceptual way of thinking. So when I was thinking in this series, I started thinking like what a building means. Like conceptually, a building is a structure that holds something inside and have windows and like columns and all that. So pluralism in this case is like very linked to that because pluralism are like, like you said, like extremely utilitarian structures that that's their function. That's their thing is to function. Like their, their stakes are not very important. Um, so I will say that by destiny in this case, the most, uh, the aesthetics that these buildings will have are very similar to pluralism. And also if you consider like that most part of the ideas that I'm, I'm borrowing or that I'm um, um, taking from are from the failure of postmodernism. A uh, brutalist was that idea of a communal, like an actual communal space. So um, I would say that this, pro this project is uh, linked to this in these two ways to brutalism. Uh, and it's not, like, like you say, it's not necessarily a link to one building itself because these are not critiques in like one single structure. It's that like, it's using the language of architecture and buildings as a whole, like what a building means. Um, yeah, and 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 also kind of like what I wonder if you're interested in kind of the limits of of rent. You know, you've talked to me about how drawing is sort of fundamental for you in terms of uh, rendering space, obviously, and and the limits of how we can think about and render three dimensional space uh, through a through a drawing, right? Um, and how you can possibly represent that space and those ambitions in a in a two dimensional um, in a two dimensional way, um, maybe a little bit connected to that. Phyllis says this makes me think about. I'm going to hope I pronounce this correctly. Pira Nazis, impossible spaces rendered in print. And I wonder, do you view these absurd objects slash systems and images as ruins in any way? Um, I will say no, um, because for for me exploring uh, impossible. Um, or things that are doomed to fail, it's a way in some way to speak about or explore the concept of utopia, which is a utopia is something that you cannot never reach because it's impossible, but it kind of gives you a north to something to follow. And in this case, if you conceive or if you present uh, projects that are impossible or are meant to fail, it's a way to um, maybe open the conversation of something that it actually might be possible to change. Um, yeah, ironically, right? Uh, yeah. Phyllis says, does utopia have a space for failure? Maybe it does. We don't normally think of it that way, but uh, but your work opens up those questions. Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah, utopia is basically a failure, but it's something that gives us north to follow. Absolutely. Um, there's another question here for you, and I want to invite um, Michelle and Tiana to both come back. We have about 15 minutes here to wrap up, and so anyone at home who has uh, lingering questions for the other artists, please feel free to put them in the chat. I know I have some, so we'll we'll go for about another 15 minutes here. Um, uh, oh, Diego, do you want to take that question from Alana live while we're waiting for some more questions to come in? Um. Sure. Um, it says, to what extent do you believe your work falls under the realm of world building mm -hmm. in art? Um, I would say that it's not a world building per se, because most part of the ideas in my work and most part of the uh, projects that I've made are based on something that actually exists in the conceptual realm. Uh, and I actually, in, in, in my opinion, if something exists conceptually, it's a, it exists. It maybe doesn't exist mat like on a material way, but it actually exists because some, someone thought about it. The fact that it's a failure, it's some other discussion. Um, so I will say no, I will say that it actually exists in the world that we live. Definitely. Um, I have one one question that's uh, percolating. Having seen um, Michelle's work kind of in the middle here uh, is kind of acting as like a, a linchpin for how I'm thinking about the other artist practices. And um, so uh, as we wait for a few more questions to come in, I would ask uh, a question directed at 
Tayana and a question directed at Diego, um, inspired by Michelle's practice actually. And for Tayana, my question for you is, um, I'm thinking about this layering process that Michelle brings up so richly in her presentation. And I'm thinking about the way that I've seen your work kind of uh, engage that layering process. And I wondered for you, if you feel uh, that does this come from an experience of printmaking for you? Did this like predate work with printmaking or do you think, in, is there a relationship with like a more collage approach for you? Just how do you think about like layering to build an image? Oh, I definitely think the, that printmaking, the history of the, and the knowledge of the process of printmaking is inherently to me goes, it happens. So I'm, um, because you have to build layers, right? I mean, you technically don't have to, it depends on what process you choose, but when you're in a, a screen printing process, it's, it benefits itself in a better way, in my opinion, to build upon more and more and more layers. And also I like the hidden surfaces that you don't get to see. There's a lot of build up and then you just cover it all up and it's only you know that it's there. But that history to me um, is, is imminent, so yeah. I think this uh, this helps our hypothesis that we're working with tonight that layering is a printerly uh, way of yeah. being, approaching an image. Uh, my question for you, Diego, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, Michelle's work is, uh, I'm looking at, uh, and, and we looked at separately, some of your other blueprints that seem to engage um, a kind of patterning that almost looks, that I almost read as decorative. So I have a, the experience in looking at your blueprints of sometimes being able to clearly read them as as buildings, as structures, and other times the optical experience of reading them more as, as pattern or like a, a decorative. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, that's, that's really interesting because uh, I know when I'm making them, I always see them as buildings because in my mind, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to build something that's impossible. So I always see it like that. And by when, like, a couple of friends uh, have told me that, like they look like patterns. And, and actually I thought about it and I know that definitely that comes from my uh, cultural background. Um, so I'm from Guatemala. So the, I, I don't know if uh, the public is familiar with the uh, regional textiles um, that are grid based. Um, so I think this is something that is really in my subconscious because in Guatemala, like there's no way to escape from that. Like I grew up surrounded by these geometrical designs and these colors that are just there. And I think that's, I'm mostly pretty sure that that's where that come from. Like from that vision of something created on the grid that it will eventually be a abstraction of a building. Um, so I think that has been really interesting in this project. Yeah, Michelle. Um, textiles are very geometrical. You know, from the way they start from the loom, it's, it's always very geometrical. It's something that I found out because it's, when you touch a textile, it's very organic, but it really comes from something very organized and very geometrical. So I can, and it's, it's it's the same process in every part of the world. I have like doing a little bit of research about textiles in every corner of the world. And you will find the geometric um, designs everywhere because of the loom and because of the way you, 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 know, you set up the threads. So it's geometric and it's very interesting to me that um, they like, they hold us together and they are exactly the same um, designs everywhere. And it's very interesting that um, Diego is from Guatemala that is very rich in textiles and is he's acknowledging the fact that he, he has this influence. I love that, I, mean, I feel very related to that. I think it's really cool that that came out of this talk, um, considering how different your work appears uh, on the face. And, and I, I'm always interested in when we have artists like this uh, in the same space, the way that they find these affinities with each other and the way that these um, sort of um, patterning and these things from, our, from our, our experiences, our backgrounds, the things we grew up, the visual culture we grew up like looking at kind of 
continues to like find its expression in our in our later work. So I think that's that's really interesting to hear, Michelle. Um, there's a um, question, one last question here for Diego, and then um, I have a question for Tiana, and then I think I'll pose Neil's question to the whole group. Um, is there an Escher-like quality to your buildings, um, Diego? Are you interested in that visual experience of going up the stairs and down the stairs and up the stairs and down the stairs? Is this an intentional reference for you? Yeah, actually, what this is funny to add. Um, so I will say that Aesthetically, it, it there can be a connection. Although I will say that Esther, the, the main purpose of Esther in, in his historical context was to explore visuals more than a conceptual meaning of what it means to make up an impossible building. Esther was more playing with with uh, optics. Um, so I will say that yeah, it's aesthetically related to Esther, but not conceptually because it's not the same um, intention. Um, I mean, I, I believe that it's impossible to invent something new, like everything is done in some, in some point. Um, so I will say that, yeah, we might, that I will take uh, that um, thing in common with Esther that it's the same like continent, but not the same um, content. Sure. Um, Tiana, one last question from me to you, which is when you're using your source material, these images, these Polaroids from your, from your family, from your growing up, do you um, repurpose the same uh, images for two different projects? Do they appear in different places or is it like one, one source image becomes one project or are you more flexible with the way you use your materials? Oh no, I definitely use the same images. <laughs> it was a point where I didn't have any really. I would probably only hit one or two. And then I started to source for my family members and like beg, <laughs> like, I know you have more, give them to me. I'll scan them and give them back to you. And so when I do have them, I'm like, I believe in juicing the image, just squeezing it out for it all until I'm done. And I go, okay, moving on. I never want to see this image again. But yes, I definitely am all about recycling. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because if you, I've heard you speak in other artist talks about the the small range of images that you had to work with because you didn't have much yeah. uh, from an archive. And so the way that you multiply those images and sort of make them visible in different formats, I think is, is very poignant in that context. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, so just as one final question, um, please a brief answer as we're just about to run out of time here. Um, from Neil, I would love to hear about the ways each artist might find space for collaboration with the others. So this is like a fun little speculative question. Um, does anyone have a, um, uh, a way that they might collaborate with someone else on the panel? Oh, I see a great affinity in, with um, Diana, with the, the images she chooses, because it's from the, from the family, the history of his, her family, and it's, I use that sometimes. So there would be a little connection that we might think about it, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. And Diego, too, and, I, and I feel it's funny because I'm like, we could all work together. Yeah, I, I like the challenge of uh, artists not being doing exactly what you do because I think that's it pushes you and stretches you the way you think about your practice. So I could I, I like I love both of you guys' work and I'm like I don't know what the collaboration will look like, but I'll be interested <laughs> in figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, definitely because um, I don't know, like at, at least in my way of working, I work with first of all a lot of research and second a lot of um, like. I don't know, like I don't, I don't have a defined aesthetic because my work is mostly what the work is about and not how, not necessarily how it looks like. So, I mean, yeah, I, I could work with both of you. <laughs> that is a wonderful place to close, I think. Um, thank you to each of the artists here with us tonight, um, especially Michelle, thank you for coming into the space and showing us your work in person. Um, thank you everybody at home for spending a little bit of your Tuesday with us. This was so engaged and I loved the questions. Thank you for this terrific participation. Um, you can see Mapping Narratives uh, at IPCNY until um, April 3rd. You can also explore the works online. The link is in the chat.
um, from the top of the talk. Um, and for the most up-to-date information, follow us at IPCNY, follow all the artists at their handles, I believe also in the chat. Um, and you can join us um, next time. Our next artist talk for this edition of New Prints is going to be on Tuesday, March 23rd, um, round two, we're gonna have uh, three brand new artists I hope will be just as interesting and engaging and interesting as tonight. So thank you everybody. Um, you can give a little wave and say goodbye um, and we'll see everyone soon. Take care. <laughs>